And now, the After Action Review with Rod Rodriguez. And welcome to a special edition of the After Action Review Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Rodriguez. Last week, we had the honor of being on site at the Bunker Labs DC at Capitol Post, The Muster 2018. We set up a table, our cameras, and microphones to capture the experience of the event, and of course, to talk to veteran entrepreneurs about their businesses. Unlike most episodes of the AAR podcast, in this episode, you're going to hear from several entrepreneurs. I cannot encourage you enough to support veteran business by checking out their social media and websites. They might have what you're looking for as a customer or perhaps some B2B opportunities. All of the businesses featured in this episode and their sites will be posted within the episode notes. As always, you can go to our website and link to them directly from www.theaarpodcast.com. You might be wondering, what exactly is The Muster? Well, to help explain the event and to kick this episode off, the Managing Director of the Founder Program at Capital Post and Head of the Bunker Labs DC Chapter, the always amazing Seda Goff. So Muster DC uh, is where business meets the veteran community once a year where we bring the whole ecosystem together and we have everybody from entrepreneurs, people who have access to capital and people who just want to support this community. Um, So it is a place to figure out where you fit as well as to grow your business and to also give back and mentor. One of the things that we've heard time and time again, and I don't honestly know if it's us or just our community just is so fantastic, is that when they come to a bunker or a Capital Post event, um, everybody talks about the quality of conversations that they have and the quality of people that are there. And especially in the startup scene and the startup world and entrepreneurial world, sometimes it gets a little muddy with vendors coming and pitching to them and whatnot. And we, you know, our community is so connected and helpful that everybody talks about just the quality of conversation. So quantity has been fantastic for this muster event, but we want to continue to make sure that we have the quality people there as well. If you have the ability to go check out the other musters around the country, go check out Philly. If you can drive up to Philly, go check out New York. If you have any interest in expanding your markets to any place else in the country, go check out their musters. If you go to bunkerlabs.org, you can go into the um, events calendar and see where all the different musters and when they are going to take place. So you can have a year's worth of getting these type of conversations. Um, we have a Capital Canteen uh, on the 16th of March at Capital Post. Uh, this is a morning breakfast from 8.30 to 11 o'clock, where you can then work out of the Capital Post space after that, so for Very the rest cool. of the day. But it's, again, that great nexus of conversation, and if, especially if you're going to continue a conversation from here, come and check that out. So I'm Matt Lumbre. Um, I am an Army veteran, and I spent about a little over seven and a half years in the Army. Uh, The beginning part of my Army career started off doing what I call tactical intelligence. So it was called a multifunction team, and our job was to basically fuse intelligence together, uh, do some intelligence gathering of our own to help the maneuver guys, the infantry guys, find the bad guys. So we'd go and go on raids and all that great stuff, which was a blast. Probably the best time of my life. Um, I moved on from that to do cybersecurity, which... um, also fun, but uh, a little bit more, a um, little bit more promising uh, in terms of the the after army career. But uh, I helped stand up uh, four uh, cybersecurity units. Actually, let me backtrack. I helped stand up four cyber units for the cyber mission forces, um, and took command up at Fort Meade. So that was that was my last job in the army. After that, I got out, and now I am the CEO and co-founder of Enabled. E-N-A-B-L-D, security.com, and we are a free organization or free website that organizes cybersecurity tools so that anybody can understand what they need to protect what they care about. Fantastic. Tell me a little bit about Enabled and how did that start? So Enabled started, so um, I took a job after the Army uh, in contracting for Army Cyber Command, and I knew I wanted to get into private cybersecurity because it's a different beast than cyber in the military and for the government. 
So um, I went to work for IronNet Cybersecurity, which is General Alexander's uh, company that he started when he got out and really got immersed into that private world of cybersecurity. You know, we did assessments for global banks, uh, for hedge funds, for mm -hmm. large uh, health insurers. And so we understood the, or I, we started to understand this arena that we were operating in and saw this giant gap, right? We wanted to get out there to see experience and see where these gaps were. And we found this giant gap in consumers and small businesses and micropreneurs um, where they have needs, they uh, are worried about cybersecurity, and none of them have any idea what to do. Um, and so that's where we decided to focus. And that was one of our main catalysts to break off and, and do our own thing. That's awesome. Thanks. And cybersecurity is a major issue right now. I think uh, the uh, former Secretary of Defense was upstairs talking about cybersecurity and the Russian threat. Uh, can you give us a little bit of your perspective on that subject, being a cybersecurity expert? Yes, would love to. So. Um, it actually affects our business model and our, and our approach. Um, our mentality is that cybersecurity right now is not working, right? right? People are spending more developing new technologies and breaches are going up. Uh -huh. So that math doesn't make sense. And so our concept, as opposed to spending time, marketing, technology, protecting large organizations, we're starting at a grassroots level, a bottom-up approach to cybersecurity. Because a lot of these companies, even so, even after spending all that money, they're being attacked through their employees who are unprotected. That's right. Right? So this bottom-up approach, if it works, will help everybody become more protected. Um, and so when we talk about Russia and we talk about the cyber threats that America faces, um, I actually like to use a quote from Leon Panetta. It's not an exact quote, but he mentioned cyber Pearl Harbor. He mentioned mm -hmm. this is something that was going to happen, you know, within the next decade. Well, our assertion is that it's here, right? We've had election meddling. We've had OPM hacks. We've had hacks from other nation states. I mean, it is happening all the time. And it's not just the government getting attacked. They're attacking us to facilitate a lot of this. Um, and so I think that's the realization that people are, need to kind of wrap their heads around is that cybersecurity, all it is, is security in cyberspace, right? right? We inculcate a lot of security mindsets in our physical world every day, whether it's picking out our outfit to ward off the weather or whether it's locking a door to ward off thieves. They're innate. They're not even learned. There's just something that we grow up with. And we want to take that same mentality and apply it to the cybersecurity world. Awesome. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the, the idea that the grassroots is where it's got to start. I think we're all waiting. For, I think maybe the world cybersecurity was misinterpreted by the general public. We thought they're going to launch nukes or they're going to blow something up <laughs> and they're not realizing it's about election meddling. It's about bank fraud. It's about money and influence. Uh, nuke's going to do its job, but imagine the repercussions Precisely. of everything else. Yes. And that's I think that's one of the biggest takeaways. And I think you are articulating it better than I have in the past, is that why nuke someplace when you can send a few lines of code and deny it? Right? Absolutely right. If you, can, if you can affect the same results, you don't have to kill anybody, right? Mm -hmm. Theoretically, or you can, right? But having that power and that option to exercise non-lethal weapons of war... It's an intimidating factor that I think we need to start wrapping our heads around. So now that we've scared the hell out of everybody listening <laughs> to this podcast, where should they go if they want to uh, hunker down, figure it out, and get their cybersecurity house in order? ENABLDsecurity.com. Come to us. Uh, we have great resources, and we're not afraid to link to other sites, right? Like, nobody has a monopoly on intelligence, right? Nobody has a monopoly on cybersecurity. So if we find best practices that work elsewhere, we're going to direct people to those websites and make sure that they get what they need uh, to protect what they care about. But um, the one takeaway I have for everybody out there, two-factor authentication, go to turnon2fa.com and learn what it is and turn it on for every single online account that you have. It's easy. It doesn't take a lot of time and it will keep nearly any hacker out. Fantastic. Two more questions for you. First one is, um, this event, the muster 2018 DC bunker labs, capital post, what is your takeaway from this event? The, you know what, I'll tell you what I'm taking away from today. And this is, you know, an old Paul Graham maxim is, you know, do what doesn't scale, right? Mm -hmm. I don't scale. People don't scale. These events don't scale. You can't put it online. I mean, you can, but it doesn't have that same, efficacy. not the same punch, but I've kind of tied, um, the marketing concept or at least our philosophy towards marketing and outreach to dating, right? Um, this might be a little crass, but when you go out and use pickup lines, right? Uh, yeah. You might might have a date for the night, right? But that's usually as far as it goes. But when you when you bear your soul and you engage with someone directly and honestly, 
that opens up a, a relationship that'll, that could last forever. And that's what we want to do with the folks that are out there because we understand cybersecurity isn't always one, fits, one size fits all. Um, but the answer isn't to just abandon one size fits all. It's right. to engage people and see what f- sizes fit. So I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for me is that this, these types of events are extremely important for us to be at. Last question for you. I hate these passwords where it's like it's got to be one, <laughs> two uppercase, two lowercase, three special symbols, a number, and you have to do a special dance. I don't get it. Is wh- What's the way around that? What, it, tell me I can be secure and not have to remember 60,000 passwords that all look crazy. Yes, I love it. I don't know. I didn't. For the audience out there, I didn't tell him to ask this question, but I'm really glad you did. Boom. He was There was a lot of eye winking, though. Yeah, right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, password managers, okay? Password managers. So a password manager is an app on your phone or an app on your desktop that you can download, and you can put all your passwords in there. Um, and it's protected with an extremely long password that obviously there's one password that you have to memorize, and you can use biometrics to lock it down if your phone supports that. Um, so I'm going to talk about two things real quick on password okay. managers. One is... A lot of folks tell me, well, it's a lot of work to put all of my passwords in there. And I say, sure, it is some work. Think about how much time you spend resetting passwords that you don't remember. Truth. Right? How much time you spend creating these long, ridiculous passwords with asterisks and question marks and uppercase and lowercase, right? It's crazy. Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing people say is, and to back up, password managers let you do that automatically. Push of a button, it spits out as long as you want, as complex as you want. You click save and you're done. Love it. It's great. So password managers. Password managers. And there's a there's a worry because people think one password that holds all my other passwords. I say, I understand. Yeah. Right. Password managers only business model is protecting your passwords. So that is all they care about. I, pr- I trust that a lot better than number one, my memory. Number two, pieces of paper. And number three, using the same password everywhere else. That's true. So pick a long password. Remember that. And remember that when people try to hack accounts, they usually try to go after the account owner. So your Facebooks and your Googles, and they try to get a bunch of passwords, not 30. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. password manager is like, like I say, there isn't a good solution for passwords. Password manager is your best bad option. All right, man. Thank you so much for taking you time bet. to sit with us at the After Action Review podcast table here at the DC Bunker Labs Muster. Thanks again, man. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much. and I am the owner and the founder of True Pop Popcorn, which was formerly Dallas Popcorn for many years. We just switched a name here in the last six months. Uh, My affiliation with the military is that I was waiting on a commission and I got sent to Korea for a 45-day assignment, which turned into a 329-day assignment. And when I got back here, I got deathly ill with tuberculosis. And so I started pursuing just how diets can help reverse illness and disease. And that's actually how I threw away my civil engineering hat in addition to my architectural background, and I jumped right into pursuing a doctorate as a traditional natural path. And so when we created Dallas Popcorn, now True Pop Popcorn, it was all based on trying to put together a product that would be nutritionally sound, that would be able to offer people something that they could snack on, yes, but more importantly, something that would be fortified to help with their health problems. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I think of health food, when I think of nutrition, Mm -hmm. popcorn doesn't jump to the top of my list, but I have a feeling you're going to change that. I'm going to change that simply because the industry has changed as well. When I first started in 1999, potato chips were the biggest selling snack. Today, there are more than some 1,200 popcorn snacks on the product. That came primarily from people starting to get into the whole health and fitness industry crave. And what people were doing were researching who are the thinner people, who are the nicer uh, fit looking people, quote unquote, around the world. Mm -hmm. And most of the Europeans and people like that are our better looking people in terms of fitness. And their secret was 200 uh, grams of air pop popcorn every night before they go to bed. And so that pushed into the United States and it became huge. When I first started, there were probably four or five popcorn competitors out there on the shelf. 
And now the snack owl basically consists of different types of popcorn products. So you're telling me popcorn. Popcorn because as a traditional naturopath, I obviously believe in healing the body nutritionally, not doing anything invasive, staying away from the pharmaceutical drugs. But the one thing that Eastern and Western doctors agree on is the amount of fiber that an individual needs on a regular basis because of what it does for the gastrointestinal system. And when you take a look at products that provide fiber, popcorn is typically at the top of that list. The problem is, is what I mentioned upstairs in the pitch, is that not all popcorn has high fiber in it, depending on how it's cooked. The fiber content in and of itself is that that is located in the whole grain kernel. And so you're not going to eat the kernel. So what you have to do is transform the kernel to a popped corn. Mm -hmm. And so it's that process, whether it's wet cooked, kettle cooked, or air popped. And we have a tendency as Americans to just douse it in butter and salt Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and take something that could have been kind of nutritious for us right. into junk food. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's Yikes. that's very true. And that's where our obsession is. Uh, that's not going to change. People I, um, snack for different reasons. Yes. A lot of it has to do with just thinking about that taste, but usually it's emotional. People are, you know, when you're nervous, you're snacking. When you're bored, you're mm-hmm. snacking. You know, just chewing on something helps us feel good. Right. And we want it to be substantive. So it's got to be crunchy. Mm-hmm. And if you add that salt factor to it or that sugar factor to it, then it just makes us feel really nice. I love the word you just used. Mm-hmm. Obsessed. You're obsessed with mm-hmm. your product. Yes. And I love that because I that's, that's the popcorn I want to eat. I want to eat popcorn that is designed, that is... Uh, cared for with an obsession for quality Mm -hmm. because I know I'm going to get the right right popcorn. That's right. That's right. Being here at the muster, this is the the 2018 Bunker Labs DC muster. This is a big event. What are you walking away from this event? What did you get from this event? Oh, for me, I got my nerves back. Got your nerves back. I was so nervous. I was just like, so I've never had to pitch. We've been focusing on building the the, the brand Mm -hmm. and not necessarily building the company. So I'm just getting to that point where we're positioned to scale up. We've got new packaging. We've got everything in place. All our little ducks are in a row now. So now is the time to look for investors. I had the opportunity to be around people that, you know, said, be careful when you start looking for money, make sure this is in place and that's in place. So I had the pa- patience as my middle name. So we were doing that. And so now is the opportunity to do that. So for me to just come and pitch for the first time and have it be over with is great. The feedback that I got from people, even before the pitch, just based on what we've done and just looking at the product setup has been good. So when I, I saw you earlier today, uh-huh. you looked nervous. Nervous. You looked yeah. nervous. <laughs> I did look nervous. <laughs> and now yeah. when I saw you walk down those stairs, yeah. you looked like a the weight, weight had, had been lifted. lifted you were, I, really? fact, I don't even think you actually walked over here. I think you floated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's it's not that you were nervous. I'm, pers- I'm an engineer, so I'm not accustomed to that linear segmentation thing. I speak... As an ordained minister, as a naturopathic doctor, we're always doing wellness workshops. I'm talking and I'm looking at my audience. I'm feeding on my audience. I'm always diverging here, there. So when someone says, you've got five minutes and you need to follow the information on this slide, I'm like, what? You know, so that was where I was. Well, you did yeah. great. I saw, yeah. I saw your presentation. I thought it was fantastic. And I've had your popcorn. And for anybody listening, this is no, I'm not being paid for this. <laughs> I am not, I, but... Remarkable popcorn. Thank Fantastic you. Thank popcorn. Thank you so much. Uh, my wife and I, we were eating your popcorn at the last presentation, mm-hmm. at the last event, at the last Bunker Labs event. And uh, it's funny because like there were some free bags of popcorn. I ate the first one. And I was like, where's the other ones? <laughs> I want more popcorn. Mm-hmm. So now that you're, you, you know, the day is coming to an end, what would be your message for a veteran entrepreneur who's looking to get into this type of environment with like-minded folks? What's your talk? What, what would you tell them capitalpost.com they need to at least come and they are truly what they say they are trying to help people find their stride so as a starting point if you know you want to do something you know you want to get into business just have a conversation with emily or zeta i mean it'll just help ground you a little bit i'm the type of person that's usually all over the map you know we have to have created multiple streams of revenue just to stay in business so i'm usually here there everywhere and they've been able to kind of Help me kind of focus, focus Dallas, focus Dallas. And so that's been very good for me. So I would just tell people, and they have all kinds of programs, and they're bringing in professionals from all aspects of growing a business, and those things are helpful. 
Well, thank you so much thank for you. taking time out of your very busy schedule. You did a great job here today, and I'm so glad that you got to sit down and talk with the AAR podcast here at the 2018 Bunker Labs Capital Post Muster. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate thank you. It. Claflin. I am a retired Coast Guard veteran with 22 years of active duty service. Um, and then I retired in 2016. In the past year, I've been focused solely on building my company, Halcyon Reflections. Terrific. Tell me about Halcyon Reflections. So Halcyon Reflections sole mission is to help people preserve stories. Um, so that can come in a lot of different ways, um, helping them take their documents, um, their memorabilia, any of their reflections, and just helping them organize them in a way that preserves their story. Um, and I'm directly focused on the veteran community um, and family members for those veterans. Terrific. I saw your pitch uh, during the last uh, Bunker Labs event, and you had this remarkable bag with you. Can you tell me a little bit about that bag and why? what makes that bag so special? Well, the bag is it was a kind of an afterthought that when I it originally built the company, it was primarily a service company. Um, and the bag is really, it's kind of like, you, I guess you could call it a time capsule or a vault to help mm -hmm. uh, veterans store their documents and their memorabilia. Um, it's special because it's built to kind of reflect a service member's um, kind of service legacy that they have. So it's it looks like a military style duffel bag. Um, actually, I built it, the original prototype, out of a military duffel bag. Um, so ideally, I would love to have a veteran have this throughout their career. They can adorn it with their patches or pins or memorabilia. Um, and then when they leave the service and transition out, they put all their documents or service records in this bag. So oftentimes, um, family members are discovering or inheriting kind of a box of stuff from their their families, uh, whether they're World War II veterans, Korean veterans, Vietnam veterans, and the family members don't really have an understanding of how to walk back through this and recreate those stories. So the idea is we know that veterans aren't often willing or able to talk about their story and they may not feel that it's important, but if they can just put the stuff together in an organized fashion, that family member can then recreate that story if, you know, if at a time that veteran's ready to, to talk about their story or if maybe if they never are, that, you know, whether it's their child or their grandchild can inherit this and then kind of recreate that story. That's a really remarkable thing for families, especially today. There are so many veterans that are, they have a, a, an, a legacy of service. And sometimes that gets overshadowed by time. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to do uh, this type of work? Well, you know, I, I joined the service. I joined the Coast Guard um, because I... I listened to stories of my uncle's service. He was in the Coast Guard while I was growing up. I was very close to him. Um, and he served eight years in the Coast Guard. And having heard his stories, it kind of inspired me to also want to serve and, and be in the Coast Guard. Unfortunately, I didn't really have the foresight to kind of capture those stories. And, and he's since passed. So I don't really have a lot to look back on and reflect on. But I know that through his experience, you know, I gained the experience to serve in the Coast Guard. Um, and it was also a connection to, you know, speak with my grandpa about his stories and now my uncle who served in Vietnam. And then I just recently found that my other grandpa was a World War II veteran as well. So, you know, I just think people have, everybody has a story, whether it's, you know, whether they think it's small or insignificant, um, they all have a story and can connect with others and inspire others. So. Isn't it strange how these little things turn into something like yeah. a mistake yeah. really turns into like a pivotal moment Absolutely, for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I totally believe in, in fate and all those things. So hundred percent, hundred percent. So tell me what are you walking out of this muster with? What is that you took from this event? Um, I think it's just a little bit more confidence um, in, you know, pitching my idea and talking to others who, you know, always tell me a story about, oh, their uncle served or their grandfather served, you know, we'd really like to more know more about them. Um, and, you know, talking to veterans, you know, and I, just knowing that, you know what, they're not ready, they're not really thinking that this is important, but we know that the family members find value in this. And they, and the veterans themselves know that our World War II veterans have tremendous stories and they are important. It's part of our history. So yeah, it's just a little bit more confidence and, you know, getting out there and networking. That's terrific. If there's anything you want somebody listening to this to walk away with from this interview themselves, what would you want them to walk away with? 
So I would say, you know, just go back to your own families. There's likely somebody that served in your family and just start a conversation. Sometimes it all it takes is, hey, can you tell me about your basic training in, in boot camp or, you know, they're not always volunteering information, but sometimes it's just a, as a question you can ask. And you may not know all the terms of the service member, and they might not be comfortable to talk enough about some of their stories. But sometimes just asking can, can kind of spark that conversation. Absolutely. So somebody listening to this right now is realizing, I have nothing set up for my family, nothing for my kids. I definitely need to get my act together and have my legacy preserved. How do they do it, and where should they go? Well, I mean, just starting with, you know, I have some templates on my website that, you know, you can download and just starting with documenting dates, dates of service. Um, That's a start. And then the next step. So I have a three step kind of process. And the first step is, you know, I call it reconnaissance, right? So you're, you're gathering all the information. You're just trying to figure out what all is it do they have? You know, is it just a piece of paper? Is it a box of stuff? And then we go through and we organize it all. So in a systematic way. Um, starting with dates of service and going to the next step like you have photos what are these important photos let's write down a little bit you know like a sentence or two um, what this photo means and where is it from and then just kind of going through those steps and then at the very end when it's all organized you can create a beautiful memory book a portfolio of that that service members record so that can be handed down versus the box of disorganized stuff. That makes perfect sense. And where can we learn more about your website? Um, so it's www.halcyonreflections.com. Um, and if you're interested in the Rakana bag, it's www.rakanabag.com. Um, so I'm hoping to start taking pre-orders and getting through the manufacturing process. Are you on Facebook, social media, Instagram, I'm any on of that? On Facebook, Instagram. Haven't delved into the Twitter world yet. Fair enough. Facebook and Instagram, LinkedIn. And, and where can they find you on Twitter and Instagram? Um, not Twitter, but Instagram is at Twitter. Halcyon. Oh, yeah, that's right. Halcyon Reflections. Halcyon and Reflections. Is Halcyon Reflections. All right, well. Halcyon Reflections all the way around. Yes. Perfect. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with us at the After Action Review podcast table here at the Muster 2018 Bunker Labs Capital Post. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lily Dag Dag. My husband was a veteran of the Army for seven years, and now I am, I guess, CEO of my own business, SiteBiz. Hi, this is Patricia Talavera. I am Lily's sister and business partner, and the also CEO of SiteBiz. <laughs> so we have two CEOs. Uh, you're both, I, I guess, your partners, your partners in this business. Tell me about your business and what it does. So our business is a WordPress web design firm, or in short, a web design firm, because some people don't know what WordPress is. Uh, We primarily work with mompreneurs like us who run their business, who um, have to do it while taking care of their kids and trying to run their lives. Uh, Recently, or actually it's been a few years now, we created Operation Site Launch, which is our way of giving back to the military. We offer discounted services to anybody who's got a military affiliation, whether it's a spouse, a brother. We're really not that strict about it. (laughs) But the point is, uh, we know that a website can be costly. And, you know, it's one of those startup costs that can be a bit harder to justify because you think, I don't really need it. But trust me, you do. (laughs) So we're just trying to make it a little bit more accessible um, for anybody in the military community who's trying to to get their uh, business off the ground. All right. Now, what prompted you to start a WordPress uh, design, design? Yes. WordPress design business? It's actually starts way before that. We started about seven years ago when my husband was in Korea. We had already moved, I don't know, three or four times. And I was starting to realize that a regular job was just not going to cut it. Um, so me and my sister said, hey, let's go into business for ourselves. Her husband is a graphic designer. Patricia's husband is a graphic designer. So we originally said, let's do websites. And then we got tired of that, decided to do social media, virtual assistants, telesummits. But about four years ago, we discovered WordPress. And we were like, hey, this is a way for us to do websites by ourselves without assistance from her husband. Husband, um, and we were like, let's just do this. Let's just focus on website design completely because really that's what we love to do. Um, and WordPress just helped us to be able to do that in an, in an easier fashion. Now, how would you describe WordPress? WordPress is, 
a content management system. And to some people, that may mean nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's essentially a way to build your website so even novices can do it. Uh, we prefer to work with WordPress because when we finish a website, we can just hand it over to the client and they can maintain it themselves. You know, we hear complaints from so many people, oh, I have to hire my developer. I just want to change one word. Yeah. And with WordPress, we don't have to do that. We can just hand it over to them, give them some tutorials, and yep. they can uh, do the website maintenance on their own with no help from us. Unless they want it, I guess. <laughs> so what's it like working with your sister, each other? <laughs> That's actually a question that we get asked a lot. And the short answer is it's like anything else. It has its good days and its bad days. And I think the most important thing to remember is to draw those boundaries, right? If you wouldn't say it to somebody you're not related to, you probably shouldn't be saying it to somebody you're related to and it's vice versa. Good advice. I mean, that's that's. I mean, those are just that's a general life thing, right? Golden rule: don't don't say nothing bad. Yeah, basically. But it's like if it's a business thing, there's no need to make it personal. If it's a personal thing, don't need to drag in the business. So we just draw those boundaries, and we've we've been pretty good about sticking to them. And that's that goes a lot. That's a lot of it. What's one of the ways that you? What what's a method that you use to make a decision that you both have to agree on? We flip a coin. You flip a coin. Yes. Are you serious? Well, there's only two of us. You don't have a triplet to break the tie, <laughs> so the coin does it for us. So your business is being run on, on, on skill and a little Coins. luck. Yes. A little luck. Absolutely. Well, luck is important no matter how you look at it. It was luck that helped me to see the VIR listing just like a couple of days before applications were uh, going to end. And if we hadn't seen that, we wouldn't be here today making all these amazing connections. You're, it's funny because you're the third person to sit down in this chair that talks about luck. They mm -hmm. talked about it um, here by accident. Right. That's remarkable. So tell me about how you became involved with uh, the Bunker Labs, Capital Post, VIR. Uh, there's another uh, organization called 100 Entrepreneurs. They have uh, monthly lunches where they have speakers talking to you about running your business. Seda was actually one of the people who spoke at one of those events. After that, we saw her at a Capital Post event, and then it kind of just went from there. Okay. Awesome. Now, uh, here you are at the DC Bunker Labs muster. What are you walking away from this event with? We're walking away with tons of new connections, um, not just people who uh, could possibly use our services, but even people who could connect us to other people. Uh, someone actually gave us a brilliant idea earlier that we should get sponsors for our non our operation site launch project so we don't have to take the hit every single time we give somebody a discount. Literally something that never occurred to me, <laughs> but is an yeah. amazing idea. <laughs> it, it, it's, that's fun because, uh, you know, podcasts run primarily on sponsorships right um this podcast for example has we, we're, we're sponsor free sponsor less we do affiliate network kind of stuff with on it and other products but sponsorships that comes with a lot of work there's right. there's a lot that goes with that um what is your next step for that what, what are you doing what are you going to do um, even trying to figure out what a sponsorship would look like. Yeah. Uh, what relationship would that person have with us or with the client? Uh, would we just line up sponsors and then just happen to give the sort of scholarships to clients who come around? It's really just a matter of even figuring out what we want it to look like before we can even take the next steps of trying to find sponsors. Right, right. Now, what would be your advice to a veteran entrepreneur who's listening to you thinking, I really want to jump into this entrepreneurship thing. I'm thinking about maybe getting involved with Bunker Labs, but I'm not I'm not sure I'm on the fence. What would be your advice to that person? Uh, I would say don't give up. It, it, it sounds trite, and maybe it is, but um, in the seven years that I've been a business owner, I've undergone through a lot of obstacles. And even before that, with my husband unexpectedly being you know, discharged from the Army when we thought we had a good three or four years left, um, there's a lot of curveballs that have been thrown at me. And the biggest reason that I can keep going through it is because I love what I do. I love being able to work with the mompreneurs or even the people in the military and helping them to make their dreams come true by being able to run a successful business, being able to do things on their terms and it's that passion and that helps me going on the days that are rough or on the days that I'm working until 4 a.m. or on the days that I don't sleep things like that yeah. I, I think it's very important to not give up but you have to have a reason to not give up that's so true you have to have a passion you got to have that 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 reason right to keep going forward 
Right. Fantastic. Ladies, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules. And congratulations on all the stuff that you're doing. I think it's going to be fantastic. Good luck with that sponsorship thing. If you can crack that nut, please <laughs> let me know more about what you're doing because that is that is a tough thing to get into. And you're going to see when you do your research, it, it is it's stuff, but it can pay off. It can, there can be some really cool stuff there. Well, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All righty. My name is Todd Connor and I was in the United States Navy from 2000 to 2004 and I am the founder and CEO of Bunker Labs, which is an organization that's helping military veterans start their own business. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that I'm sure you've heard a thousand times. Why Bunker Labs? Why, why, did, we, why did you do this? Why Bunker Labs? You know, it's in, I did not intend to start a nonprofit organization that would be a national organization in you know, today I think it's 20 cities, it was not the intent. I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, I started from a very simple place of necessity, which was this. I was in Chicago running a small business that I had started, and I was informally helping military veterans because that's, of course, a community I care about. And I was at 1871, which is a technology kind of co-working space, and I said, you know, this is, I love being an entrepreneur, I love being a veteran. Um, I know that there's one or two other veterans out there that are looking for assistance. So we had to create a program and that's what we did. We started a program and I put a PowerPoint together, which is sort of the beginning of the end of any, you know, startup business. Uh, and you know, kind of sketched out a framework. So look, I don't know exactly what the demand is, but I think that there is an opportunity if we, if we do this right to help more military veterans start businesses. So we, Put together a PowerPoint, slapped the name Bunker on it. Actually, it was Bunker Incubator to start and then shared it around Chicago. And there was a big event coming up in the city. And the mayor actually saw that we were thinking about proposing this. In 1871, our host incubator said they're wanting to do this. And everyone said, let's make a major announcement out of this. So we announced the Bunker Labs in 2000, what was it? 2013, 14, 13. And uh, what happened next was really what started the organization, which is 60 veterans reached out and said, I want to be in, I want to be in this. Wow. I have an idea. I just started. Um, I started last year, but I need help. And we aggregated all of the interest. And that really was the beginning of what we said was like, yeah, this is actually something, you know, this is uh, there's a need here. We, but I wasn't thinking about the organization, right? I wasn't thinking about, is this a for-profit, not-for-profit? It was just like, we know that there's a need. We know that we need a brand to convene the community to talk about the need and support the need. And then what ensued was uh, sort of everything that's happened since, which is we developed a chapter model. We expanded into other cities. We had a lot of veterans in other cities say, hey, I heard what you're doing in Chicago. Let's do that in Austin. Let's do that in Seattle. Let's do that in Washington, D.C., and, uh, and Bunker Labs kind of grew up that way. And I, I, I only give that detail because I think when you're starting a business, it's like, it's like saying, like, why did you join the military? Because I wanted to be a veteran. It's like, so yeah. that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's like you join the military because you want to do things. So I tell people, say, like, I want to be an entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is not the goal. What are you trying to solve? Go solve it and solve it well. And then somebody else will want you to solve it for them. And then you can charge them a little bit of money. And then somebody else will want you to solve it for them. And you can charge them more money. And that's the beginning of a business. And that was also the beginning of Bunker Labs. How do the needs of a veteran entrepreneur differ from a civilian entrepreneur? Yeah. It's a great question. Starting a business is no different if you're a veteran as if you're a non-veteran. So that's number one. Starting a business is, is starting a business. Veterans bring unique challenges and unique assets when it comes to starting a business. The challenge is um, it's, a sub, it's a small subset of the population that serves in the military. So like in a very practical sense, like if you're in Afghanistan, you're getting out in six months, it's a lot harder to start a business than if you're working at a Fortune 100 company living in Chicago and you want to start a business. So the life circumstances of veterans are very different. They're forward deployed. They're, um, you know, they live in military communities. Like the military installations on, in this country are placed in, you know, they're in cities and towns where there is no, generally speaking, entrepreneurial activity happening. So we've given, we're handing a disadvantage to the veteran 
because they've been in Afghanistan or they're in, you know, right. Fort Hood or they're in, you know, 29 Palms or they're in places where or, or you're on the USS Bunker Hill, which is forward deployed to the Persian Gulf. So wherever you're getting out of the military from is probably not in a place where there's startup activity happening. Um, so those are the disadvantages. By the way, none of it has to do with the people. Right. Like somehow people think like being a veteran makes you like less skilled. None of this has to do with skill. It's Veter- just circumstance. It's circumstance. Yeah. It's like it's pure circumstance. It's like well, where, where you live is highly relevant to how you start a business. And so if where you live is in a place that only has active duty military service members, like it's really hard to get to know people that are like venture capitalists. So it's circumstance that is the disadvantage. Um, what's the asset is the incredible network that the military community is. So you can, as an army veteran, call another army veteran who works in Silicon Valley, and they'll probably take your phone call ahead of some kid out of like Stanford MBA program. So that's the opportunity is the asset is that we have this like kind of shared commitment to each other as as a community, um, which has always driven me. Right. And that's why I'm so passionate about this mission, because I care about veterans. Like it's my first primary identity more than my college or my business school. Um, so that's our asset. Now, we haven't activated the asset. We haven't built the alumni network for the military veteran community. So that's what Bunker Labs is trying to do is like, how do you create the, the alumni network? The alumni network, like our network's more powerful than Harvard Business School's alumni network. The only difference is Harvard Business School has really invested in built in like an alumni office whereas we have not so bunker labs is like the alumni office for the veteran entrepreneur community that's really how i think about what we're supposed to do it's like create great events and make sure that the right people show up um so that's our asset that's our opportunity what's different is also important so after world war ii 49 percent of veterans came back to start businesses so half of that population came back after world war ii those that survived and started a business and they were starting, you know, dry cleaners and restaurants and construction companies and, you know, and PR companies and banks and, you know, stuff that was sort of technology manufacturing companies. So that generation did that. The difference between and this generation, 25 percent of veterans want to start a business, but only one, only I think it's like three and a half percent will. So 49 percent after World War Two started a business. Today, 4.5% will, 25% want to. So what's different from World War II to this generation is demographics. Most adult men of a certain age served in World War II. So when you got out, and it's kind of like what's going on in Israel right now. Everyone in Israel joins the military. Mm -hmm. So when they get out and they come back and they want to start a business, they have this fluency, this kind of relationship to everyone that is in the country because everyone was in the military. So Israel, not coincidentally, has the highest rates of entrepreneurship. That's right. And it's like the startup, it's a phenom. Like everyone is studying Israel. Like what's their secret sauce? There's a really great book out there called Startup Nation. And it's all about the startup mentality and the startups in Israel. It's a fantastic place. This muster event, huge event here in the D.C. area. What do you want a veteran entrepreneur to walk out these doors with? Mm -hmm. Three things. Number one is they learn something and learning happens by talking to people. It doesn't happen because like we sit in the classroom, learning happens because you're chatting with Chris and he's like, Oh dude, like, would you pay for that microphone? And you're like, ah, like, you know, 480 bucks. He's like, Oh, you could have paid 420 through this website, cheapmicrophones.com. I'm mm-hmm. making that up that, but like that little interaction is like $60 back in your pocket. So, we got to have that conversation at scale. This is why like the rich get richer. Cause like yeah. they're sitting at the country club, like having that conversation all day long. So how do we make sure that our community is having that conversation? So did you learn something new is number one. Number two is, did you meet somebody relevant? So, you know, I'm looking around the room, like there's tons of people here. Everyone has a perspective that can inform your business. Um, in a very real way, just before this podcast, I introduced you to the Bob Woodruff foundation. Mm-hmm. They need a podcast. They have resources. They have 40 organizations that they grant. They're trying to amplify their story. So how does podcasting go to the Bob Woodruff Foundation to help them amplify their story? I don't know if it will, but maybe it will, right? So that introduction was made. So that's number two. Did you meet somebody relevant? And number three, which to me is almost in some ways the most important, is like, did you leave feeling energized 
and inspired, I come out of these events and like my heart rate is up because I'm excited about you. I'm excited about what you're doing. I'm excited about this podcast. I'm excited about Chris and his 21 year career as a Green Beret and what he's you know, exploring as a creative. Mm-hmm. I'm excited by, you know, the speakers like Chuck Hagel that we heard. I'm excited by like just feeling supported like I'm part of a community and feeling like I'm part of a movement because all that inspiration is fuel to keep going. So did you learn something? Did you meet somebody? Did you feel inspired? I think those are the core ingredients that our community deserves to feel. Like, I, you know, I think one of the most depressing things, we talk about, you know, PTSD, it's a real condition. But I also think that there's a, a, a depression that sets in when you leave the military feeling like my best years were behind me. And, you know, that's ridiculous. Like, we shouldn't feel like the most interesting thing that we ever did was in the military. It's probably going to be. But we should feel like there's something that's ahead of us that's exciting. And I, and I think entrepreneurship, for me at least, is the one thing that presents as almost as exciting as being in the Navy, which is that there's something bright ahead of me. And it's ambitious and it's scary, but I'm not afraid of being scared. I've been scared before. I'm afraid of being bored. I'm afraid of feeling average. Oh, and we didn't join yeah. the military to be average. We joined to be extraordinary. And that is what entrepreneurship allows for. It's the opportunity to be extraordinary. And if we do, even if we don't get there, to be in that fight, I will take every single day over the safety security of feeling average, but feeling like unfulfilled, like I haven't met my potential. So I want everyone to feel inspired and to feel like, you know, the opportunity is there, it's real, there's a smart way to do it, we'll help you do it, uh, and let's get after it, and let's do it together as a community, because that's how we win. If somebody wants to get hold of, if somebody wants to join this 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 movement, because it's more than just a nonprofit, I think that what you've created here is community, you've created a movement. Uh, where should people go to learn more about Bunker Labs? Bunkerlabs.org, bunkerlabs.org, go online, sign up for our launch lab. So that's our... That's our like it's a, it's a twenty week experience about how to start a business. Join the launch lab. Um, we'll put you into a community of, of peers that are also going through it. You'll meet veterans from around the the country that have super interesting ideas. Whether it's fintech, media, new media, creative services, professional services, you know, dog food. Like literally, there's like three companies that are starting you know creating a dog food label going through. We put them in touch with each other. I'm like, hey, you guys need to get together. Talk about it. So all that's available. So do the Launch Lab online. Um, You can do it at night and and on your spare time. So it's designed for if you're still on active duty. Um, So if you're in Fort Hood, if you're in Afghanistan right now, if you're on the USS Bunker Hill, I want you to join. If you think entrepreneurship is part of your future, I want you to join. Um, The next class is in June. And you will meet a lot of new friends. This is your tribe. Everyone needs a tribe. Your tribe, if you want to be an entrepreneur after you leave the military, your tribe is with Bunker Labs and your tribe is with Launch Lab Online. So uh, come join us in June for that one. Sir, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to sit down here at the table, the After Action Review podcast table, which you have been so kind to allow us a little bit of space to set up our equipment. Do you have any parting shots for anybody? I think if you want to be an entrepreneur, get out there and do it. Figure out the smart way to do it. There's a way to de-risk it. There's a way to keep your day job while you start a business. Boom. And we'll show you how. So don't quit your job today. That's not the task. The task is get to Bunker Labs, keep your day job, and then we'll show you how to build uh, an income stream part-time. And then you'll know when it's right to jump in full-time. Parting shot fired. Parting shot fired. Thanks again, sir. Much appreciated. Great job. Thank you. Great podcast. Love it. Awesome. My name is uh, Andre Greeny, and uh, I'm an Air Force veteran. My company is called Al Mocha, and it's focused uh, on coffee from Yemen. Sort of the original coffee in that the practice uh, of cultivation and drinking of coffee started in Yemen. Yes, we're a coffee company, but I'm in it because I'm a development company. And really, it's about what is the impact going to be on the lives of 100,000 farmers in Yemen. Google coffee, Yemen. Click on the first hit, buy my coffee. Coffee, Yemen, or buy Yemen coffee, Yemeni coffee, any variation of coffee in Yemen. If I'm not the first Google hit, I'm the second one. You can't miss me.
Hi, my name is Angela McConnell. I'm CEO and President of the Northern Virginia Veterans Association. I'm 22 years retired military. Our main mission is to support the veteran comprehensively. Um, many times, once a veteran gets off of active duty, um, they're good for a little while, and then they realize, okay, I'm without a job now. What about my health care benefits? Didn't I have something else possibly coming to me? And we help those veterans figure out um, what their benefits are, what they're eligible for, and we don't provide the service necessarily. We case manage and provide the coordination of care. So I came here just to find out what the muster was about, um, Bunker Labs. I was familiar with the name. I didn't really understand their mission, actually, until I listened to the, the previous um, podcast. Um, so I'm educated on that now. And I really, after three years in business, we have the statistics. We know our mission is valid. We know we're filling a huge gap in need. And uh, right now, we need the investors to understand what we're doing, how we're doing it differently, so we can move to that next level, hire employees, and get them really doing this mission well. Um, I'm walking out of here with um, some great bits of information. Just listening to um, the panelists and, and, and the keynote speaker was, was fabulous as well. The panelists had a lot of good practical information on you know, how to go after the funding, what to do, what not to do. Um, it could apply to for-profit and some of it for non-profit as well. My name is Keith Stryker. Uh, I am a U.S. Army Iraq War veteran. Uh, I am currently serving my country by starting, uh, well, starting and running my nonprofit called VOC, or Veterans Leadership Coalition. Um, it is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., helping to assist veterans transition properly um, out of service to become successful um, excuse me, civilians. I love the space. It offers you so much, whether it's mentorship, whether it's leadership, whether it's financing, whether it's learning how you know a company should be run or how you can scale the company. Um, all those things are great. I want to see more of that in different different sectors. I want to see more opportunities like this provided to uh, minorities of all kinds. So not just gender minorities, but also ethnic minorities. Right. One of the things, if I can just be candid, uh, I did actually get an offer from an unnamed source, uh, a company that will, is actually offering to partner with uh, VLC to kind of help us to grow and expand um, and to scale. So that means, you know, taking my, you know, 60 member, 60 volunteer member uh, staff and turning them into possibly turning them into actual paid staff. So we are a part of the WeWork cohort. So you can always go to WeWork, call WeWork uh, and be asked to speak to um, the I VIR program, or you can always go to VLC or VETS what is it? VetsLC.org. Keith Stryker, thank you so much for uh, sitting down with me. And I have to say it on air for the rest of my listeners to hear. This man has possibly the coolest name, <laughs> Keith Stryker. I, I even like thank saying you. it. <laughs> Keith Stryker. Thank you, sir. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Superhero names for all. Yes, yes. And uh, congratulations. It works out. It's pretty awesome. Thank you. Same. Folks, this event was a game changer for me and my business partner, the Sniper Eye of Greenberry Media, Chris McPhee. The event presented opportunities to meet so many different businesses and organizations. We learned, we became inspired, and we both walked away with a renewed sense of purpose in the media company that we're building together. The muster wasn't just a business meeting. It was a coming together of a like-minded and like-spirited community of veterans who continue to give back to their country by becoming part of something bigger. They don't just sell coffee, popcorn, or cybersecurity. They offer solutions to problems they care about. Food and drinks, they have a passion to create. And they lead organizations with missions far greater than themselves. Veteran business owners wade into the choppy and tumultuous waters of entrepreneurship, armed only with the lessons they brought with them from years of military service and a core idea of what they want to do. Those vets not only survive the crashing waves of setbacks, financial hardship, and the emotional drain of slowly starting a company, they find ways to weather the storm itself and to find comfort in the chaos of business while others would flee and seek the shelter of routine. Before I bring this episode to a close, I want to shine a spotlight on a group of people who are linked arm in arm with those veteran business owners going through the struggle. They can often go overlooked and unheard, but they deserve so much more. And I'm talking about the veteran spouse, the veteran family members, who are often the very rock a service member relies upon. Veteran spouses and family often find themselves in situations out of their element. Their loved one deployed, 
and that spouse or family member is left trying to establish themselves as a future entrepreneur, sometimes in countries they just arrived in and don't even speak the language. They too have a place to call home at Bunker Labs. So what did the After Action Review podcast walk away from this muster event with? Well, we walked away fired up. We have a roster full of veterans chomping at the bit to be juggernauts of their industry, and we will be there to bring you their stories of what's gone right, wrong, and everything in between. You will always find us at www.theaarpodcast.com. We are on iTunes, Play Store, Stitcher, and wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. This is the After Action Review Podcast, and I will see you at the next episode.